friends. As you may have noticed, I didn't post a video on Friday, which was supposed to be day five of my challenge. And that's why you're getting day five now. I basically just shifted my weekend to be Friday and Saturday instead of Saturday and Sunday. Part of the reason why is because I spent that time creating this vlog. I don't know if you noticed, but it's a little bit different from my usual style. Why did I make this change today? Two reasons. Number one is that I wanted to give myself a challenge because apparently writing 5,000 words and filming and editing a vlog wasn't enough of a challenge. And number two is because I thought it might be fun to try something like this on a day when, instead of featuring a book, I'd plan to feature an animated TV show. Specifically, I'm talking today about the incredibly polarizing adult cartoon show, Bojack Horseman. <laughs> Why is Bojack Horseman so polarizing? I completely understand why so many people have issues with this show. The titular character, Bojack Horseman, is an anthropomorphic horse who starred in a successful sitcom in the 90s, but has basically just been a washed up star since. Bojack rarely takes responsibility for anything in his life. He has every single vice you could possibly imagine, to the point where it makes a lot of viewers uncomfortable. But personally, I think it's a great show, for writers in particular, to study. Theme-wise, it's taught me a lot about generational trauma and its repercussions. But craft-wise, it's taught me a lot about narrative structure. Today, I want to discuss the episode Ruthie in particular. It's episode 9 in season 4, if you're worried about spoilers and massive content warning for miscarriage. I'll add chapters to this video so that you can skip to the prompts if necessary, so do that now. So the episode is called Ruthie, and it's called that because it's a frame narrative that features a child named Ruthie, who is a descendant of Princess Carolyn, Bojack's agent. The entire episode is just Ruthie giving a presentation to her class during Ancestor Day, and as part of the presentation, She's having to talk about a particularly rough day in the life of her ancestor. So Princess Carolyn's day is the main plot, but there's also an intersecting subplot that involves Bojack. But overarching narrative-wise, it doesn't add much. So we see the progression of both of their days. Bojack spends the vast majority of the episode trying to locate a birth certificate for another character in the LA County courthouse. It's a typical trip to the DMV type deal, that I think provides some much needed comedic relief because the Princess Carolyn plot is so much heavier. Princess Carolyn's day begins with her breaking her treasured gold necklace, which she had always believed to be a family heirloom. Then she gets fired by one of her more high-end clients. She sort of just brushes it off and then goes to the jewelers to get her necklace fixed. While she's there, she learns that Judah, her beloved assistant, lied to her then, she goes to the doctor to learn that she has miscarried and likely will never be pregnant again. Then, she finds out the necklace isn't real gold, it's just costume jewelry from JCPenney. Then, she fires Judah for lying to her. Later, as she argues with her boyfriend, she reveals that this is the fifth miscarriage she's had. Then, she breaks up with him and returns to her office, completely alone now that Judah is gone. She's just settling on the couch when Bojack calls. And Bojack's just like, let me tell you about the terrible day I've had before just listing all his mundane complaints, like the fact that the pink berries was out of his favorite toppings, so he had to go somewhere else. And Princess Carolyn just tells him how, when she has a bad day, she just imagines that her great-great-great-granddaughter is talking about her in class and telling her classmates how everything worked out in the end. And Bojack's like, but that's fake. And Princess Carolyn just says, yeah, well, it makes me feel better. And I just love slash hate how that ending just recontextualizes the whole episode. It's such a heart-wrenching episode and really shows the impact of successful narrative framing. So I'm gonna give you two prompts today the first is to write an unlikable main character whose complaints pale in comparison to his side characters, 
and in doing so, characterize both characters. And your second prompt is to write a story with an unusual narrative frame, and then try to find an organic way to work the frame into the narrative itself. Bit of a late start today because this video took forever to put together, but let's get started. Hey guys, it's just before 8 o'clock. I didn't hit the 5,000 word goal, but I'm stopping early because I really want to get this posted today. I managed 3,073 words, which means I'll have to do just a little bit more every remaining day next week. But that's fine. I think I got some of my best writing done today. I didn't finish the complete story, but I think tomorrow's prompt will be a very good one for what remains in the story. So I'll be finishing it tomorrow, and I guess I'll end the challenge with 9 stories instead of 10, which isn't a big deal. Thank you so much for hanging out with me today. To those celebrating, I hope you've had a great Christmas. I hope you enjoyed this discussion and this very lackluster animation, and I'll be back to my normal self tomorrow. Bye!